Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Pray First, the conversation we have Monday through Friday right here on the Pastor Doug page. It's so good to be with you guys. This is an interactive conversation, and by that I mean we have chat. You can respond to each other. You can meet new friends. We also have a Pray First official group page that you can join and talk to people. There's a lot more content on the official Pray First page. You can do that. You can share this out on your page. Please consider sharing this out on your page because most of our Pray First family comes from you guys sharing this out. I feel like Mr. Rogers walking through the church and through the office this morning. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, good morning. Get in here. Pray first. It's conversation Monday through Friday that we have right here. We talk about putting God first. Everybody say putting God first. Hashtag first. Hashtag live. Hashtag shared. Hashtag recorded. If you're joining us at any other time than the 7 o'clock hour right here, on Pastor Doug Page. What's up, Tabitha, Neil, Samantha, Bonnie, Kelly, Christina? What's up, Cliff? Cliff, my friend, man. I love me some Cliff Lancaster. What's up, Audra, Candy? Good morning, everybody. Come on, get in here. Welcome to the first day of the week because we're giving God the first of our week. I know Sunday is technically the first of our week. Maybe some of you gave God the first yesterday. How many of you guys attend church somewhere yesterday? If you attended church somewhere yesterday including online, or maybe you and your dog, maybe you and your family. Hashtag where you gave God the first on yesterday. Here's my hashtag, hashtag Crosspoint. That's where they paid me to show up, so that's where I went to church yesterday. But I'd like to come visit your church too. So if you have a church and you want to talk someone into letting a crazy person come and visit or even come speak, let me know. Fantastic. All right, so... Got a few questions for you this morning. One of those questions is, what does God want from you? I'm going to get me a sip of this highly caffeinated uh, coffee drink right here. Do you guys ever wonder, where does he get those little cups? And where does he get those little coffee drinks? I'm still kind of waiting on a few of you to get in here. Uh, Here's where it happens. Here's where the magic happens right here. I want y'all to be telling me what does God want, by the way, while we're doing this. That right there, that's where the magic happens. Woo-wee, I'll do a whole video on that one day. What does God want from you? What does God want from me? Now, that's a sort of a trick question, so some of you are going to put some stuff out there, and, you know, I understand. But uh, I am tricking you. What does God want from you. What does God want from me? Yesterday, as I was teaching and preaching and thinking, one of the things that resonated with me the most was this idea that God is our Heavenly Father. And so I know we were kind of talking about a different subject, but we're going to start talking about God as our Heavenly Father. We're going to talk about three gifts Three gifts that a father gives their children. Candy Warren busts out there, God don't want nothing from you. And guess what? Candy Warren is our Pray First official winner today, Candy Warren, out there in Texas. You're right. God doesn't want anything from us. And that flies in the face of relationships and That flies in the face of family. That flies in the face of responsibility. Hit some hearts, hit some likes. Let me know you're breathing out there. Because God doesn't want nothing from us. Look, God, who is whole and eternal and loving and kind and patient and generous, and long-suffering, and self-controlled, God, who is faithful, he doesn't want anything. Look, God and want is an oxymoron. Those two can't exist together. God and want is an oxymoron. God is complete. Come here, come here, come here. Come here, come here, come here. God is complete. Everybody hashtag complete. God is not waiting to fulfill a want or a desire or a need. God and want are oxymorons. God is complete. You and I are complete 
in him. Woo! So as I was up there speaking and I was talking about God doesn't want anything from us. God wants something for us. I want you to start tagging some friends who you love. I want you to write their name right there in the comments. Go ahead and start tagging them. I want them to, to see, pray first. I want them to see today. I want them to understand. I want them to be able to cut through the religiosity. I want them to be able to cut through any kind of denominational you know, tags. And there's nothing wrong inherently with denominations. It's just an understanding of you're with a like-minded group of people. There's nothing wrong with that. But when it begins to inform your when it begins to inform your faith beyond the teachings of Jesus Christ, it becomes more of a, what's the word? I think that uh, in A Tale of Three Kings, it's described so well. I wish I could, authoritarian. There we go. That's the word he uses. That's, that's the word that is used in A Tale of Three Kings that it becomes so authoritarian in your life that it goes beyond the teachings of Jesus that you think you have this required response, this required, what is the word, that, that you have to do something to serve God. Okay, so that's where I really want to go this morning. So as I was up on that platform and I was talking about God doesn't want anything from us, he wants something for us, and that was just sort of a, a lesser thought to support the message yesterday. If you didn't hear the message yesterday on obituary faith. I want you to go back and look at that and listen to and watch obituary faith, okay? Because it's going to be a powerful step in understanding what we're talking about. We have grown up, and, and it's natural. Come on, guys. How many of y'all know that what we want is natural. It, it's pretty important that you guys watch the whole series that I just preached at Cross Point because it's going to really inform and support these next couple of days, maybe these next couple of weeks. Uh, as Gene Edwards was talking about, we've got a world full of Christian hurt, church hurt, faith hurt, disappointment. How many of you have ever been hurt, disappointed? How many ever felt like you've disappointed someone? How many ever felt like you couldn't live up to a standard? How many of you felt like you've ever been a bad example or you've been a victim of a bad example? Or maybe you felt like that your faith is incomplete. Maybe you feel like, you know, you need to earn something. You need to work towards something. You need to pay God back. You feel like God's done so much. You need to pay God back. If you feel like you need to pay God back for your sins, you will make other people, and here's how you'll know if you feel like you need to pay God back, you will make other people pay you back for their sins. If you feel like you're trying to earn, you know, God's grace, if you're trying to earn God's love, you will begin to make others earn your love and earn your grace. So what does, let's, let's just kind of bring this back, what does God want from you? Nothing. What does a good parent want from you? What does a good parent want from their children? Nothing. A good parent doesn't want anything from their children unless they are an egotistical, um, I don't want to use a scientific term to define something that's not scientific, unless they have a very large ego and they're trying to fulfill their lives, you know, through your lives, or they're trying to fill their parental life through their child's life. Have you ever seen a parent that just drives their children crazy because they are living vicariously through their children? I need you to go to college. I didn't go to college. I need you to, to do this. I didn't do that. I need you to be on the basketball team. I need you to be a cheerleader. I need you to be a football player. I need you to be a star. And and these are the parents that, you know, sit, you know, down the fences of Little League games and shout and scream and holler and make a fool of themselves shouting at volunteer men and women who are refing and umpiring games to infuse and invest in the in the children of our community's lives. And these parents over there are jumping all down their throat because little Billy isn't on the field and little Billy isn't on the basketball court, though little Billy is not coordinated, not tall enough, and can't dribble or hit a ball. And they're just screaming, why is little Billy on the bench? Because they are living vicariously. They are trying to feel importance through their children. Have you ever seen, I want to know, hashtag yep, yep, have you ever seen a parent 
want from their children. Hashtag yep, yep. Hit some thumbs. Have you ever seen a parent want from? They're not investing in. They're withdrawing from their, their children. And it is ugly. When we see that, we think, what's wrong with you? When we think, when we see that, we think, something's broken. Something's not right. Something's off. Have you ever looked at a parental relationship with a child and thought, ooh, that's kind of weird. That's kind of, that's kind of messed up. So what does God want from you? Nothing. Good parents don't want anything from their children. They want something for their children. What does God want for you? Galatians 5, 22. God wants for you love. God wants for you joy. God wants for you peace. And a lot of times we think, you know, what I want and what God wants is so far apart. We think that what I want and what God wants is so different. I'm going to tell you something this morning. What you want and what God wants for you is much closer than you may think. Come on, come on. I know if I were to ask you, what do you want? You might say, I want a Ford F-150 Raptor. I want a brick house in the suburbs. I want a Rolex. I want a Keurig. I want whatever him. I want her. I want him, her, it, Keurig, house, Ford Raptor. Uh, and I want it now. I want it all. I want it all. And I want it now. You know what I'm talking about? But the truth is, what you really want might today might not be what you want tomorrow. And if you get what you really want today, it might stand in the way of you getting what you want later. You can get what you wanted and still not have what you want. So God wants something for you. What does God want for you? Love, joy, peace. Some of you think, ooh, I don't want any of that love, joy, and peace. Yes, you do. And a lot of us are going after things that we want or people we want or him or her that we want so that we will feel love. A lot of us are purchasing things that we can't afford based on our current circumstances because we think we're going to feel joy. If I could just go get this, if I could just go get that, if I could eat this, if I could have that, if I had the freedom to go do this, and I'm going to extend my credit, I'm going to do these things, I'm going to reach out there, I'm going to grab joy, only to find that you accepted a substitute love and a substitute joy, and now you don't have peace. So you got him, you got her, and then you realized, huh, you can get what you wanted and still not have what you want. And getting what you wanted then is keeping you from getting from what you want now. And you can go out there and you can purchase, 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 purchase and rob your future, come on, with credit, to get what you want today, only to find it's not what you want tomorrow. And you wished you hadn't purchased it. You wished you hadn't leased it. You wished you hadn't went there again. You wished you hadn't spent your money here again. You wished you had your money back. You wished you could have a refund. You wished you could have the new version of the thing you thought brought you joy. And now you don't have peace. So look, the things God wants for you are closer to what you want than you think. You want love. You want joy. You want peace. When Jesus was teaching the disciples to pray, he very clearly reduce the chaos around faith. When Jesus was teaching the disciples to pray, he very clearly reduced the chaos around Christianity. When, when Jesus was teaching the disciples to pray, his first two words were so magnificent that it gives us an understanding as to what God wants for us and God doesn't want anything from us. And here's what the Lord Jesus taught the disciples to pray. He said, when you pray, pray like this. Our Father. Everybody hashtag our Father. Because I'm telling you, some of our authoritarian faith has led us to believe that we are God's slaves, that we are God's servants, that we are servants of God rather than children of God. But Jesus said, not so. When you pray, pray our Father. Let me go back to this again. What good parent wants something from their kids? No, no. 
Good parents want something for their kids, and God, our Heavenly Father, is a good, good Father. He clears up the confusion about religion. He clears up the confusion about Christianity, that we aren't uh, hired hands, that we are not employees, that we are not servants, but that we are, in fact, part of the family business. Look, my name is on the business. My daddy owns the company. My daddy created the universe. My daddy loves me. I don't work for, I don't earn merits, I don't earn points, I don't earn grace, I don't earn salvation, I don't earn right standing, I don't earn righteousness, which is right standing, I just am. <laughs> I am because my daddy made it so. Here's the problem. You and I know that God the Father is perfect. But you and I also know that we ain't. And yes, I know ain't ain't a word, so I am going to say it. We ain't. Everybody hashtag ain't. Here's the problem. We know that God our Father is perfect. We also know that we ain't. And here's what we know about bad character. And here's what we know about bad behavior. We know that bad character and bad behavior begs for punishment. We know that bad character and bad behavior begs to be treated like a servant, demerits, getting written up, getting warned, getting let go, getting severed, getting removed, getting unattached. We know that God is perfect. We know that we aren't. And we know that in the world we live in, that bad character and bad behavior begs to be treated like a servant. It begs to be punished. And yet God the Father calls you a son. Woo! When you pray, say, Our Father. God calls you a daughter when you pray. Hey, say our Father. Yeah, but I don't deserve it. That's right. I couldn't earn it. That's right. I've got demerits. Probably so. <laughs> I mess up. Yep. I blow it. Yep. My church tells me, whoa, slow your roll. You're what? You're, you, the church don't tell you who you are. Well, my denomination says if, well, who? Your denomination doesn't tell you who you are. Well, my pastor, huh? Your pastor doesn't tell you who you are. The Son of God says, you are my son. You are my daughter. When you pray, you pray our Father. Bad behavior begs to be treated like a servant, but the Father still calls you son. The Father still calls you daughter. Now, we do serve our Father. But we are not sons because we serve. We are not sons because we serve. We serve because we're sons. We serve because we're sons. Some of you daughters out there thinking, you keep saying sons. Okay, well, let me just say this. The Bible refers to you daughters as sons, but he also refers to us sons as bride. So let's not get so quickly offended, okay? Because <laughs> I am not. Uh, the definition of a bride. Woo, I'd be an ugly, ugly bride. Let me say this, and I want you to hashtag it. We are sons by birthright, not behavior. We are sons by birthright, not behavior. Paxton, Cooper, and Jarvis, my three sons, had absolutely nothing to do with being my three sons. When I tell you absolutely nothing... I mean absolutely nothing. We, they didn't even exist when God decided to give them to us as sons. They didn't have names. Uh, they, they didn't do anything. They, they didn't earn their way into the Bell family. Come on. They didn't, okay, we got some merits. We got some points. No, no. You are sons and daughters by birthright, not, not, come on, come on. Not by behavior. Luke chapter 15, verse 17. Let me get you out of here. Luke 15, 17. But when he, the prodigal son, who had been off living uh, promiscuously, uh, addicted, in sexual immorality, when he 
the, uh, when he came home to his father, he began to rehearse and practice how he was going to you know, apologize and make it up to his father. And he was thinking, how many of my father's hired servants, everybody hashtag hired servants, how many of my father's hired servants have enough bread to eat and spare and I perish with hunger? Hired servants. I know what I'll do. I'll rise and go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. I want you to write that out. I am no longer worthy. I am no longer worthy. He's thinking this through. He's going to go tell his daddy. Here's what he's thinking. He didn't make it to all this, but he's thinking it through. I'm going to rise. I'm going to go tell my father, Father, I've sinned against heaven. I've sinned against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And so he rose up and came to his father. And listen here, his father never let him even talk about it. His father never let him finish his sentence. His father never let him get to the part where he was going to explain, well, see, what, I, what had happened was, come on, how many of us feel like we have to explain what had happened was? No, no, the father never even lets him get to this process. The father didn't ask him, what have you been doing? Where's my money? Can you pay me back? Uh, you smell like pig. You're a fine Jewish boy, but you smell like a pig. You need to go get a bath. We'll talk about you earning your way back to the house. No, no. When he rose to and came to his father, the father saw him while he was a great way off and had compassion, everybody hashtag compassion, ran and fell and kissed his neck and said to the son, and, and, and the son said to his father, Father, I have sinned against you and, and I have sinned in your sight and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And, and that's where the father stops him and the father doesn't even respond to the son. He responds to the servants. I want you to see the difference. I want you to see the designation. The father does not respond to the son. He responds to the servants and he says, bring out the robe, put it on him, put a ring on his hand, sandals on his feet. That's three gifts we're going to talk about for children, not servants. And bring the fatted calf here and let us eat and be merry. For my son was dead. He was now alive. He was lost, but now he is found. Every gift that he gave the prodigal were gifts you give a son. Every gift he gave the prodigal were gifts you take away from servants. You take away their robe. You're a servant now. You take away their ring. You belong to me now. You take away their shoes so they can't run. I want you to, I want you to notice those things as we begin to speak about these for the next couple of weeks. Let me read you a couple of verses. John 8, 35, And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Galatians 4, 7, Therefore you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then a joint heir through Jesus Christ. John 15, 15, No longer do I call you servants. This is Jesus speaking. For a servant does not know what his master is doing. Isaiah 61, verse 10, I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God, for he has clothed me with the garment of salvation. He has arrayed me in a robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom adorns his head like a priest, and as a bride adorns herself with jewels. Listen to me. I want you to notice what the son said when he was thinking about what he was going to say to his father. He went to his father and said, I am no longer worthy. Come here, come here, come here. He indicated he felt like at one point he was worthy. Some of you feel like you've done too much. You've trashed your life. You've made too many bad decisions. You're making bad decisions now. Notice the son said, I am no longer worthy. Guys, he never was worthy. Some of you feel like I'm no longer worthy. Sons, you never were worthy. But being a son is based on birthright, not behavior. Father, right now in the name of Jesus, I pray that you would open the eyes of our heart that today we would see ourselves as the sons and daughters of Christ, that we would pick our head up and that we would not be held captive with the yoke of bondage, but that the truth would set us free. In Jesus' name. Hashtag live, hashtag recorded, hashtag shared. Get this out on your page. Love you guys. Bye-bye. See you later.